All right, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go left to right from the actual presentation screen in terms of who we have here. Now, of course, they are right to left based on the actual here in the panel. So thank you guys for making this nice and confusing for everyone. Uh, so first and foremost, I want to introduce Ming Chao. He is a senior lecturer at Tufts University Department of Computer Science. His areas of work are in web and mobile security and, uh, of course, web and mobile engineering. Ming has spoken at numerous organizations and conferences, including the HTCIA, OWASP, InfoSec World, Design Automation Conference, or DAC, DEF CON, Intel, Source, and B-Sides, and a little bit of an additive as well. He is also one of the chief reviewers of CFPs for the Wall of Sheep at DEF CON. <laughs> Thank you, and welcome, Ming. That's a good one, the Wall of Sheep. We're still accepting, uh, we're still accepting uh, CFPs, and uh, the good news is, is that uh, a lot of first-time speakers, um, we take serious consideration from them, and we take a lot of pride that a lot of first-time speakers at the Wall of Sheep uh, they go on to bigger and better things. Thank you very much, Ming. Of course, I would also like to introduce Justin Pagano, who is a lead, he leads the security and operations engineering team at Rapid7. And it, he's a tall guy who loves dogs, clearly from his picture there. He's also very passionate about InfoSec, science, grammar, and Oxford commas. So, uh, full disclosure, uh, Justin and I also both work together at Rapid7. So, thank you very much for joining us today, Justin. Thanks for having me. It's not true. <laughs> Uh, internal joke there, of course, but uh, we'll continue You're on. Wrong. So also, I just wanted to finally introduce who is, again, going to be over the audio here in a moment. Let me just quickly put her over that audio so she can actually talk to all of you. Is this too loud? Tracy, can you actually say hi real quick? Okay. Hi, everyone. Awesome. Thank you very much. Hey, Tracy. Hey, Tracy. So uh, Tracy Mayleaf uh, left behind a glamorous world of law firm li li librarianship, sorry to seek out a white hot spotlight of information security industry. She started as an independent research business, or she has started an independent security business in early 2016 called Sherpa Intelligence. Many of you probably know her from her Twitter handle, Infosec Sherpa. So she is providing competitive intelligence, news monitoring, and social, social media consulting services. She earned a Master of Library Information Science degree at University of Pittsburgh. She loves the Panthers, by the way. She'd like me to mention that. <laughs> Tracy was recognized by Walters Kluwer Law and Business Innovation and Law Librarianship Award in 2016 and the Dow Jones Innovative Award of 2014. Innovation is her jam, to say the least. When she is not being able to guide, uh, guide up a mountain of information, she is studying hard and being a sponge to absorb everything in InfoSec-related information. She likes OSINT, research, and two-factor authentication. Dislikes, bad passwords, and sun-dried tomatoes. So thank you very much for joining us today, Tracy. <laughs> thank you so much for having me remotely as I'm quarantined in sickbay here. Thank you for also not bringing con flu. So we appreciate that. Yes. And of course, lastly, there's myself. So I am Keith Hoodlett. Uh, I'm an engineer of the customer success team at Rapid7. I also recently co-founded the InfoSec Mentors Project uh, from https colon slash slash infosecmentors.net. Uh, with my co-founder and good friend, Jimmy Vo. Uh, I'm passionate about helping people learn about security and information security in, uh, in, in joining the industry. And I've presented or uh, created, I should say, a series of questions for the panel uh, surrounding kind of three different viewpoints, uh, one from the educator's viewpoint, one from the uh, viewpoint of someone who is moving laterally into the industry from a different role, and of course, one from the management viewpoint of the people that are actually doing the hiring. So uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and get started here. So the first question is going to be for Ming Chao. Uh, so for Ming, question for you. Uh, what have you found to be the biggest challenge in preparing students for the industry? So I want to ask, how many of you here are in, in edu who's still a student? How many are? OK, so quite a few. Goodness. There's a good amount here. I um, think the. What I find the most difficult, the question is the most difficult thing I find, right? What do you find to be the biggest challenge? So yes. The biggest challenge is, I think the biggest challenge is, I see a lot of schools, they, uh, they wait too late to get students out of their comfort zone. And one of the things, and I'm sure Justin will probably say a little bit more about this, is, you know, it's the idea that you know, 
when you get into industry or you get your first internship, a lot of students would walk in with like deer in the headlights. Um, I, I hear a lot of, I see a lot of juniors when they get their first internship and they write, they write to me at the end of the summer saying, I wish I got more instructions from, I got, I got more feedback and supervision and instruction from my supervisor. And my response is always this. My response is always, welcome to reality. <laughs> because you'll be lucky enough, I mean, in some courses in, uh, in education, you're given a specification. You're given a documentation on how to work on a problem. Sometimes it's even like 11 pages long. You also get, you also get the number of points that you will get, you know, for checking off the boxes. You're not going to get that at, uh, at a workplace. And that is a huge adjustment that a lot of students uh, need to make, is that everyone's been so beaten, so brainwashed, so trained to, here's the instructions, all right, here are the instructions, this is what you need to do, these are all the things that you need to get in order to get an A. It doesn't work like that in the, uh, in the real world. And uh, there's also a lack of opportunities I see in which students work on open-ended projects when you'll be lucky enough to get a sentence about what to do. I think that's the biggest challenge of them all, is to get them out of that mindset and say, okay, you know, here's a, pro here, here's a little task for you. Uh, here, here are a few books, go and do it. I think that's, that's by far and away the biggest challenge I see. Yeah, that's uh, one, something that I thought of as you were talking about that is how looking back on my college education, I regret not joining um, some of the other clubs like the Information Insurance Club um, and other like offensive security clubs that happen to be at the school I was at. Uh, and, and for people who might be in schools right now that don't have those clubs and you're not comfortable trying to start something up like that, um, leveraging the local meetup community is huge. Uh, and that, again, that's something too where I'm not sure the school I went to, Penn State, had uh, a, a meetup community because Penn State's kind of in the middle of nowhere. Uh, but those two things to try to, using those two things to try to get over that challenge is probably going to be hugely important for people who are either in academia and trying to get into the community or if you're not in the, uh, I'm sorry, in the profession. And if you're not in the profession and you're not in academia, then those, those meetup communities are huge and like InfoSec mentors, that's an example of something is that just for the area? Everybody, it's everywhere, it's uh, worldwide. Yeah, so finding those groups of people who are there to provide support for others to, to learn and uh, join the profession, it's just... Uh, this is actually a good opportunity as well for a uh, question for Tracy. So Tracy, being that you're a, a non-traditional move into the information security industry and you've certainly made a splash uh, on Twitter and, and a lot of other things that you've done uh, speaking at other conferences, what have you found to be the biggest challenge for entering into the industry laterally? The biggest challenge I faced was talking to security pros. And if I talked to two security pros, I'd get five opinions. <laughs> so th there's a lot of varying information, and it's very confusing. You get people who will say to you, you know, I'll ask, you know, well, what, what sort of thing should I study, you know, in InfoSec? And you'll get things like, well, you know, will you just get a SysPay? Okay, well, you know, when you say that to someone, you're thinking, okay, well, what is that? You know, if they're new, um, you'll get people who will say, certs are everything. You'll get people who will say, certs mean nothing. Uh, so there's just such a wide range of information that is being uh, thrown at you or suggestions made at you that it's very confusing and very overwhelming. And there were moments when I was, when I first started poking around, it was more just my quirky hobby. I wasn't really looking at it. Uh, immediately as a job change or an industry change, but I, you know, you would finally find another new person to talk to and you kind of swap stories and, you know, hear the same things of like, everybody keeps telling me this, but then I keep hearing this. And I, I know that there's, you know, there's no way that we can herd the whole sheep of, of security pros to get on one page, but if you're dispensing information, be mindful of, you know, of what you're saying and maybe even give the asterisk of, okay, you may pe hear people say this and that's why they'll tell you that certs mean nothing. But it's just kind of throwing things out there is really a big challenge to get 
passed, and it, I finally kind of put it together in my brain to get some background information about the person who was dispensing that information, and that helped put that, uh, those suggestions into a framework that I could understand their motivation for saying it, and then either you know, accepted it or disregarded it based on you know, what I wanted to do. So that was really the biggest challenge, was sifting the wheat from the chaff, so to speak, of you know, understanding the information that people were telling you. And this is actually a good opportunity as well, since Justin, you are a hiring manager in security. I'd be curious to know what you found to be the biggest challenge in actually hiring for the industry in terms of maybe looking for skill sets, looking for certifications, education, et cetera. Yeah, uh, for us right now, um, we're kind of shifting our focus a little bit in terms of skill sets we're looking for. And, and we're really looking for people who have strong uh, software engineering backgrounds or development backgrounds. Uh, especially within a broader um, context of working in some other security role. And it's hard enough as it is to find good security talent for both technical and non-technical roles, but when you throw in basically uh, another role's skill set into the mix, fully or partially, it becomes even more challenging. Um, but for people who are looking to break into InfoSec, if you already have some security certifications, you have some security uh, knowledge, um, and you really want to bolster your resume, essentially, I think software development skills are, beginning, are going to become more and more important as um, trying to keep up with the latest threats and attacker trends uh, requires the you know, automation of different security processes. And there, there is that huge skills shortage that people keep talking about. You know, there are gonna be like one to one and a half million unfilled security positions around the world by 2020. And it's like, okay, well, let's assume we're not gonna find all those people. Like we, we definitely haven't found them today. So what's an alternative that can either help us fill that gap um, temporarily or permanently and having those software development skills to automate a lot of the manual work that we would otherwise need more humans to do is gonna be hugely important. It's actually a really great segue for my next question, which is for Ming. What skills are you encouraging students to focus on learning? So what I've been encouraging students to do are a couple of things. When I ask the question, what do I encourage them to learn? Well, I get a lot of uh, criticism for doing this. And uh, first and foremost, I, uh, the most important point in a lot of my courses, the way I structure them, is learning how to learn. Learning how to learn. And the reason why that's an important skill is, look, there's going to be new stuff all the time. There's going to be a lot of new technologies that are, that are going to be coming out, you know, every day. And it's going to be very, and one of the things about technology is, is that it moves very, very fast. It moves very, very fast. So, yeah, a lot of students criticize the fact that I have to, you know, a lot of my assignments are kind of loosely, a little vague, and I let them, you know, in order to, you know, get to what they need to accomplish, they gotta look at things like Google and Stack Overflow. Well, yes, and the reason for that is, look, when I was a student way back in the day, 15 years ago now, I didn't take a course in web. I didn't take a course in mobile. I didn't take a course in cybersecurity. Heck, it didn't even exist. So what did I have to do? I learned from people. I learned from uh, different resources on uh, diff diff a lot of different resources. Um, even, is anyone a fan of cooking here? Anyone a fan of cooking? I mean, how do you learn how to cook? You learn how to cook by, you learn how to cook by watching YouTube videos. The YouTube, uh, sometimes cookbooks from other people. Same analogy, same thing applies in, in technology. Same thing in this field. The other two things I stress, uh, you know, and I feel that we've moved away from this uh, over the last few years, I think we've forgotten the basics. I think we've forgotten how to read and write properly and communication skills. And I'm sure, Justin, you must have, I mean, I'm sure you and I can drink over this and we can complain a lot about this, about how, how that skill is just basically lacking. If I had my way, I mean, the other thing I wish I would tell people, which I don't do, 
uh, you know, an area I could actually tell students to do, yeah, take a course in public speaking. Again, basic communication skills. So just to summarize, learning how to learn, taking responsibility for your own learning, and the real basic skills of reading and writing. Things are gonna last forever. That, that point about learning how to learn is huge, but it's hard because it's easy to say, well, you just need to learn how to learn more. But that's such an abstract thing. Like, how you do that, and I don't know all the ways you could possibly teach yourself how to learn better, um, but I remember uh, an important part of my college education was taking classes, you know, we had electives, but I focused on some different categories of elect electives like philosophy classes, and this helped me, but I remember it completely changed the way I just thought in general. Um, you know, some intro to philosophy classes and philosophy and logic and whatnot. But on top of that, learning how to learn, bolstering that abstract skill, I think can be done by just experimenting and tinkering and just, and not tinkering blindly, but pick something small that you want to learn about um, and just run through it step by step and then break it down and build it back up or build things from scratch. Uh, whether it's hardware, software, or something like that. And it's just going to change how you approach solving new problems. And it's something that takes a lot of time to develop, and I, I don't think there are that many people out there who have like fantastic learning how to learn skill sets. But it's just something you have to develop over time so that you're, you're better suited to m not just break into InfoSec, but move within that field. Because you might break into a position where it wasn't what you expected security to be. And you're going to be like, I want out. Like, I, I still want to try this other area of security, but like, that has almost a completely different skill set. Um, I'm curious what Tracy thinks coming from, uh, was it a law background? Yeah, and actually that was, that was kind of my next question as well is um, for Tracy, because you have more of that public speaking, that kind of communications background, I'm, I'm curious to know what skills you're currently working on to get more of a technical knowledge as well, because you have that, uh, that mindset of knowing how to consume information, and you've built kind of the other side of what Justin and, and Ming are suggesting. Um, when, you, when you build those skills or you have those skills, what are some of the technical things that you think would be worth covering or things that you found valuable in, in learning more about? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Yeah, I am in the unique position of already coming into this with the soft skills, with the research skills, with the information organization skills. Uh, so I'm focusing on the tech side. I have been attending workshops and classes and I'm working on that net plus. I have, you know, in my mind, you know, I've accepted the fact that certifications are going to be uh, a point, you know, the way to get past the, the gatekeepers of, you know, into places. So I'm working on NetPlus first. And just the technical side, you know, I want to be able to basically read the tweets in my timeline when people make mention to, to technical things. And I, so I do that, you know, through structured learning, but I also do it on my own. There was a, a tweet that I sent out today and some earlier uh, that were going around of, you know, don't make someone feel bad if they don't know something or, you know, mock them for asking questions. I ask questions all the time. If I see a technical term that I don't understand, I go to someone whom I know is approachable and, you know, what does this mean? What, you know, what's a rat? What is, you know, what is this? What's, you know, what, what, are, what do these things mean? So for me, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, focusing on the technical side and this used, used to stress me out uh, because I, I, kept saying, saying to myself, I have all these many years of lost time to make up for. And it was just, it was overwhelming. And finally someone said to me, well, the technology changes dramatically basically every three years. So he said to me, I actually envy you. He's like, I have all this useless information <laughs> that is stored in my brain. Uh, he's like, but you get to look at this all new and just build on all the new things going forward. So. That really changed my point of view and lowered my stress level. So I'm just, I'm looking at, at tech right now. And along the way, I also want to help others. So I know just enough to be dangerous to talk to uh, less technical audiences than my skill set. And just starting even with vocabulary words. I'll speak to librarian groups and just kind of introduce you know, the terms of DDoS to them and what it means and what it means in context to them doing research and things like that. Uh, so it's definitely, 
I'm very technical focused at this point, and I do long for the days when I could read a novel again, but until then, I'm <laughs> just focused on reading uh, technical books. Awesome. So uh, this actually is a, a good uh, segue into a question for Justin, which is what are some of the resources that your team is leveraging to develop some of these skills? Did you say research? Resources. So like, uh, are there any particular websites or um, particular books that you guys have consumed or enjoyed or tools that you like to work with and play with to, to develop your skill sets? Oh. Um, there are those different, uh, what are they, MOOCs, like massively online yeah, yeah, like online courses. courses. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, that every now and then we'll run a, a deal. So a course that's usually 150 bucks was like 10 bucks. Nice. Uh, and it's you know eight hours, 20 hours, 40 hours of training about like everything you need to know to get started build to get started building web apps in Python or something like that. Um, th those are awesome because you get to do it at your own pace, and it's not just oh read this book and maybe pop this, what you used to put a CD into your computer, but now I don't know what they do for those certification books anymore. Um, oh, you go to like a website, download the content or something and watch like a slideshow. But those, those online uh, training platforms like Udemy and you know, Codecademy is kind of a light version of that, or at least last time I checked, you're, you're getting your hands dirty and you're actually building things and doing things actively along with the instruction. Um, those are those are pretty invaluable because they, they don't just cover security topics. They'll cover you know, other topics within technology and outside of technology. Um, trying to think other resources. While I'm thinking, I'll, I'll let Ming chime in. And I actually do have a pointer question for Ming as well. So can, can, you, can oh, okay. you think on that? So, um, what, so what are some of the resources, Ming, that you're actually suggesting students go to? Are there any specific books or websites that you've really enjoyed or even like programs or anything that you think that has been really valuable to your students to, to start getting involved in, in, in like learning? <laughs> oh, uh, you mean in terms of resources, in terms of websites? I say, well, we want, I, the one resource I mention all the time to people, Hacker News. Here's the reason why. Because it's a good smorgasbord of like, not only just tech, but also the societal content of tech, uh, of technology. And uh, it really has a good collection of, uh, of, of you know, current events and, and resources like range from how to build something like exactly what Justin was saying, like how do you actually build a, web, a mobile app with React Native. And you can even get into discussions such as, well, what happened yesterday with the shadow brokers releasing the next uh, dump of our uh, NSA, uh, you know, the NSA tools. Uh, it's a real good smorgasbord of, okay, uh, what's going on right now? But that's what security is. I mean, security is what the field is. It's not just a technical field. It's also a non-technical field. And that's one of the beautiful things I think we, uh, one of the beautiful things about the field is that, you know, anyone can get into it. The barrier of entry is pretty low. Uh, if you're interested in the legal piece of cybersecurity, then you can focus on the legal side. If you're interested in the privacy piece, then go into privacy. If you're interested in the educational piece of it, then you go into uh, the uh, educational piece of cybersecurity. But it's a broad, broad field. Um, I would also like to add, I, am, uh, I feel very grateful that I also have some other resources as well, too. And uh, wait for it, you ready? Yeah, I do. It's uh, Nick Davis. There he is. There he is. Uh, and also Sarah Gibson. Uh, she's right over there. And um, Nick is a former student of mine who's rattling out Rapid7. Uh, Sarah is at Faircode. And the other, another resource I can add is like, me, Tracy, Keith, Justin. And one of the things I have that is very important I tell students is that, you know, the, other, the most important resource I think is also people. Uh, it's a networking piece. I think people kind of forget how small this field is. Uh, somehow, in some way, everyone knows each other. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, and I wish I, I knew this a lot earlier, but I certainly brainwash a lot of, a lot of uh, my students that it's, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And that I'm sure for those of you who've been in this field, that resonates true every day. Absolutely. 
Uh, Justin, anything to add for the resources side before we move on to the next set of questions? Well, I, I was thinking about how um, people can be successful after they have just broken into InfoSec, because I think like a lot of people here, if you're trying to break into InfoSec and you're actually, you have a strong desire to do it, I think you'll be able to do it. Um, but once you get in, Jack mentioned in his keynote before that counterintuitive point of doing more work, like look for more new things to do within security. Um, and this is something that, you know, from my personal experience, I feel like benef benefit ben benefited, words? Benefited, oh, there it is. Benefited me a lot when I first broke into InfoSec. I started out, um, well, before that, I was doing some software engineering work, unstructured at a large bank in Pittsburgh, and then I ended up working at Freddie Mac, and I had worked with the recruiters there, telling them, like, I really want to do security work. I don't have any security experience. I got this Security Plus certification a few months ago. What do you think? And the, the first project they put me on was working on a software engineering team, but consuming you know, application security reports, static code analysis reports coming from the security team, and I had to go fix those bugs. Uh, but eventually, you know, I was already within a rotational program there, and that helps. But after I had moved on to my next rotation, which was non-technical security work on a governance team, I started meeting other folks within the broader security department and asking questions and looking around. Uh, and eventually, one of the managers there, um, he came up to me and, and asked me to help part-time do some of their security risk analyses. And then eventually I started to get exposed to doing web application penetration testing. And I learned a whole bunch of stuff in a very short amount of time. Um, and it really just boils down to persistence and, and motivation. And that comes naturally when you have uh, you know, an, innate, an, an innate interest. Words are hard today. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Words. <laughs> Thanks, Justin. Uh, so one other question I had, and this is more specifically for Tracy. So are, Tracy, are there any specific resources that you found useful in terms of either websites or books that you feel mm -hmm. worth mentioning as, as something that people that are looking to break into the industry would find beneficial? So the librarian gets the book question? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm actually, I was going to talk about social media as being a key resource. Um, you know, online resources are, are great. Um, just to kind of uh, tag along with what Maine said about people, uh, you know, don't forget that if someone, you know, if you start to follow some big names, you know, or well-known names or just people in InfoSec that, whom you trust, you know, for their knowledge, I take the point of view of, you know, if they're tweeting an article, if they, you know, went through the effort to send out an article and post it on social media, I, I should read that. <laughs> that is a, a reading suggestion. Um, as far as you know, any physical books off the top of my head, I I can't think of any. There's there's a lot. If you um, if you go to my my blog, I have lots of uh, books that I have I've received suggestions from people, and I've just kind of uh, posted them there. Um, I've been so buried in just actual manuals and things like that that I can't really recommend anything specific. But I just I don't want to. Uh, you know, play down the social media aspect at all. That's a really crucial tool for learning, even just following conversations. You know, if I see words that I don't know, I look them up. If, you know, if people are tweeting articles or posting articles to LinkedIn, that to me, that's a sign that that's something that I should read. There's a tool called Nuzzle, which is a Twitter aggregator, and you can follow people and see uh, the things that they're they're posting, and if you see that there's a security article that 30 people in your Twitter network have read or have interacted with, then you might want to make it a priority to read that. Then, if so many people are looking at it, so you know, kind of look to social media as a tool as well. Awesome, and one other thing as well, I know specifically for books, one of the places that I've gone is the Palo Alto Network Cybersecurity Canon. It's C A N O N. They have a lot of novels, uh, technical books, recommendations that they've kind of read through and, and rated and felt were worth reading. So if you're looking for just some place to start, that's one place that I've enjoyed personally. Um, so we're gonna kind of take a, a bit of a step ahead on some of the questions that I've written just given time. Um, and this next topic is gonna be more specifically tied to certifications. And I'm gonna ask kind of each of their viewpoints on certifications from kind of different Different perspectives. Um, so starting with, with Ming, I just want to ask, Ming, do you encourage students to pursue certifications and why or why not from your perspective? Okay. So 
what I'm not going to do is, how many people here have certifications? How many people, like in some way or form? Okay. So, I'm going to echo something that Tracy said earlier on, and because this is actually, this, what Tracy said earlier segues into this conversation. And uh, I'm, I'm sure I heard that Tracy heard that very mixed opinions on certification. Was that right, Tracy? Uh, probably, yeah. <laughs> okay. There's a lot of articles out there on the dubious value of certain certifications. I think we all know what we're talking. I think we know what certification is in question here. I, I think we know. A few letters in it. Maybe. Yeah, it has a few letters in it. And uh, the worst thing that you want you can do to answer this question is, if you go completely bad mouthing uh, uh, certification or the idea of certification. I I do advocate I, on a side uh, a note very related to this. I did have a certification at GCIH through the Sands Institute. And I do advocate for them. I advocate for the Sands Institute. I know what they offer. I'm an alumnus, and uh, it has served me well. I'm no longer certified. My certification has expired. Uh, there are some good ones out there. The best answer is, and I've gotten this question a few times from students, perhaps I will answer that question in the way that was passed down to me by a gentleman named Peter Sullivan. I believe he's at CMU, at Camp Carnegie Mellon. Uh, he was on the HTCIA, the High Tech Crime Investigation, in 2007. I was, uh, like, many of, like many people, I was trying to figure out what to do with my next step in my career, in my life. I mean, I was at a loss. I was literally, like, at a standstill. And I was questioning the, I, I would, I, I've been seriously pondering getting the CISSP. And I asked Peter at a HTCIA meeting, hey, hey Peter, you know, I, I'm trying to figure out what to do with my next step in my, in my life. And I'm seriously considering the CISSP because it seems like the, the way to get into the door of a lot of information, a lot of security, uh, security um, positions. Peter just stood there for 30 seconds, dead silent. He asked me these, he said these words to me. Do you need it? Bang. That just woke me up and I, uh, that, that really, really like hit me like a truck. I had to ask myself, did I need it? And I, the answer is, the short answer was no, I didn't need it. In some places, if you're going to like the Department of Defense or in some job, yeah, you actually do need a certification. It's a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and it's a very debatable one. But if you're going to, I'm not going to, you know, say yes or no, but the best answer is ask yourself, do you need that certification? And this is also a good one for Justin, I think, as well, is um, when you're reviewing resumes, is it that you find you, you're more likely to interview someone because they have a certification, or is it more of like an it depends? It's like a maybe icing on the cake situation, or is it, you know, this person has a certification, therefore I'm considering that I should probably interview them? Yeah, so the, the roles that I interview for uh, involve more technical security work around building tooling, um, and performing different security operations like incident response and vulnerability management and, and things like that. And so we're keeping an eye out for uh, practical, demonstrable experience in those areas. Um, and a, a certification isn't a disqualification for those roles, but it's not something that is a requirement either. Um, if someone has a certification and puts it on their resume, I'll be like, oh, so I think I understand what they went through to get that. Like I, I went through um, the CISSP, m whatever the most popular book was at the time, and the exam, and my previous employer paid for it, so it was, you know, worth doing in my mind. Um, but I think what Ming was saying is spot on. It, it depends, like whether or not you get a certain certification. Do you need it to get into a certain role you're trying to get into? Um, you you definitely get some valuable knowledge out of. Uh, studying for those exams. Some of that knowledge is definitely outdated, but now you're getting some historical knowledge that adds context to 
you know, future problems you go out and solve. I think, I think Jack made a good point during his keynote about how uh, in the security space, there are definitely some personalities who cross that boundary between skepticism and cynicism, and they become too cynical about things. And there is a lot of bashing about certifications. Um, there are valid criticisms of the value of them, but I don't think they have no value at all. I just don't think that um, they, they're a hurdle that everyone's gonna have to get over to prove their worth within the infosec space or when they go to break into the infosec space. I think, I think you'll find more, more employers these days will be more impressed by uh, a project, that, a small project that you have in your GitHub repo. Oh look, I, I wrote this Python script or web app that does XYZ security thing. Um, oh, and uh, you know, I'm a I have um, s status with or I participate in these security groups in the area. Uh, and there, there are all these other ways, other than certifications, where you can uh, prove to employers out there that yes, I, I am qualified for this role. But certainly, if a if a job posting says minimum requirements, CISSP or Security Plus, like yeah, get it. And it's not going to be a complete waste of time. Like some of that knowledge you get might not be useful, but other parts of it will, will be. It's, it's kind of absurd to say it's a complete waste of time and money, um, especially if it does help you get that job that you're trying to get. Thank you. Uh, so moving away from the, the talk of certifications, Tracy, I'm interested in, in getting your thoughts on what transferable skills outside of information security have you found to be an asset um, as you've been moving into the industry? Being able to talk good <laughs> has been a, a big skill. Uh, yes, being able to speak to people on uh, different uh, levels within an organization with different skill sets. You know, I come from a background where I'm used to having a, to enforce copyright within an organization. And in some ways, it's not that much different than security, because if you do either one wrong, you're getting into trouble. Um, so I'm used to being able to, you know, to speak to different levels of people and the organization of information, you know, being able to, you know, think through things and with the user in mind of thinking of library policies or uh, even research, you know, handing over research to someone, you know, yes, this person is a, a well-educated lawyer that I was doing research for, but they're also still a human with all kinds of information surrounding them that they have to work on for different cases. So being able to be proactive and sort information in such a way that it can be absorbed more easily. So uh, those are a lot of the, uh, the non-security skills that, that I have that I see are lacking. And sometimes it's very frustrating for me coming from such an organized environment <laughs> to look around in security world. And sometimes I just like, let me organize that for you. <laughs> like, let me help you. Let me let me organize some things. And yeah, so some of the chaos of security world is just very, uh, is very foreign to me. Awesome, thank you. Um, do you either of you, I mean, because we're coming to the top of the hour, I want to make sure I grab a couple other questions. Did you guys have anything you wanted to quickly add in on top of that in terms of like skills outside of the, the technology or maybe the understanding of security that are beneficial to the job? Yeah. Um the Risky Business Podcast is a great podcast. They, like a lot of podcasts, they type up their show notes that have, you know, 20 or so links in them about very relevant um, articles about what's happening in, in the security space, and they have some interesting interviews as well. Um, also, if you're trying to have more relevant or well-rounded skills or experience when breaking into InfoSec or, or building out your job opportunities after you break into InfoSec, learning about um, like DevOps, DevOps practices and tooling like Chef uh, and, and getting exposure, like go to a DevOps meetup and a security meetup, like get exposure to that community as well because when you break into InfoSec, you're gonna be working with those people a lot and those skill sets are gonna help you do a better job at security. Awesome. So I'm going to echo both what Justin and Tracy said. I mean, they nailed it spot on. And I actually would like to add them both together. Anyone here from, anyone here from UMass Amherst? Anyone? Anyone you met from UMass Amherst? So Brian Levine, who's a professor in the computer science department, said last year here at Harvard at the New England Security Day, he said he had a slide that 
should resonate pretty well is educate yourself broadly because sometimes the best answer is not technical. Um, I don't know if a lot of people know, but uh, I worked here at Harvard for 10 years. Hmm. So for me, it's, I left in 2010. I, it was a very good 10 years, but I, it was time for me to go, and I left on my own terms. So it's interesting to be back uh, here at Harvard. I worked in environmental health and safety, and I was the only tech guy in environmental health and safety. And one of the things that really served me well uh, working with a lot of non-technical people was I had to communicate a lot of ideas. Um, and that, that served me well for a number of reasons, but three things in particular. Number one, I had to communicate with a lot of non-technical people. So it wasn't about the programming language, the framework, the database problem. No, it had to be in simple, simple language that business people, uh, the business owners, and the, uh, the stakeholders had to know. So that's number one. Number two is um, it was environmental health and safety. And you know, it's now when I think a lot about the past, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to hear that I had at Harvard working in environmental health and safety. And the reason is, is because, you know, it was health and safety. And that what it means is health and safety first. If you go to a civil environmental engineering program, you can't get a civil environmental and engineering degree without learning about health and safety. But you can walk away with a computer science or computer engineering degree without knowing a damn thing about health, safety, and security. And I feel ultimately that's the pro why we have a lot of the problems that we are facing right now. Um, but having that mindset of environmental health and safety first um, I really didn't put together the pieces of a dot until recently. And so I'm very grateful for that. And that's the mindset that I developed over there. But number three, what was also important is um, understanding the business, pro uh, the business context. You know, learn about the subject matter. In this case, was like things like occupational safety, industrial hygiene, lab safety. So I had to learn the, 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 the basics of those. It wasn't learning about the next programming language or you know, whatever coolest framework at that time was. Thank you very much. So since we're coming here toward the end of the talk, I just wanted to give each uh, of the speakers an opportunity to answer the following question. We're going to start with Tracy and then go with Ming and then Justin to close. What parting wisdom do you want to share for, the, uh, for those that want to break into InfoSec, starting with Tracy? Uh, I would say that your people skills, honing your people skills, networking, uh, being able to explain things to people, any sort of people skills is really going to be paramount to not only your own success, but just the success of the industry is how I see it. So uh, if you don't already have those soft skills, work on them. And if you need help, ask. There's you know a whole community, but I would say, uh, people skills, so those sort of soft skills are uh, really a key to success. So, and Ming, again, just to repeat the question, what parting wisdom do you want to share for those that want to break into InfoSec? InfoSec is a lifestyle. <laughs> there it is. Thank you, Ming. Justin? Um, I, I want to emphasize maybe in a different way what Tracy was saying about people skills. Um, in my experience and from what I understand about a lot of security roles out there in the world, uh, security teams are omniscient uh, and their engineering and IT counterparts tend to be omnipotent. And so you will know a whole lot of stuff that's wrong with your organization that needs to get fixed, how to fix it, and you won't be able to do a thing about it. And it's gonna drive you crazy unless you have those people skills. And I, I don't think I, I need to reiterate a lot of the other stuff we talked about in terms of how to develop technical skill sets and other security skill sets. Um, people skills are important when you think about it this way. When you're doing work with a computer, it, it can be frustrating sometimes. You have to translate some desire you have into something the computer understands, but once you do that translation, the computer will do it for you. 
When you're working with sentient biological, neurological computers, you still have to do that same process, taking a desire you have, translating it into something they understand, but then you have to convince that computer that they want to do that too. And if you can't do that, it's not going to last in the long run. Like, even, even if in the short term, they're not convinced that they want to do what you want them to do, but they'll do it anyway because the security team told them and they will, they'll get in trouble if they don't do it or something like that. That's going to last for a few months, maybe a year or something like that. You need to hone those people skills. Um, one, because it's the right thing to do. You don't want to like have awful relationships with people at work and you want to work well with other people, uh, but you'll be more successful and the security of your organization will go up because of it, because those people will do what you need them to do from a security perspective. End of sentence. Awesome, thank you sentence. very much. So I, and again, I just want to thank the panel for joining us today, Tracy, for doing this remote. Again, please reach out to all of us on Twitter. We're all, I'm sure, very happy to interact with all of you to give you more suggestions uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. I know that the gentleman here will be here for the remainder of the day as well as I will. Uh, so again, thank you very much for the panel for joining us today. Thanks for coming. Thank